Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host, and today I'm absolutely delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Joel Furman. Uh, Dr. Furman is a board-certified family physician, uh, internationally recognized as an expert in nutrition and natural health care. He's a prolific author, written about 12 books that I'm aware of, and uh, seven of these have been on the uh, New York Times bestseller list, which is amazing, including Eat to Live, The End of Dieting, The End of Diabetes, Super Immunity, and others. He's the director of the Nutritional uh, Research Foundation, and uh, he is also uh, the founder and, uh, and director of the Eat to Live Retreat in San Diego, uh, a residential retreat helping people deal with chronic disease and food addiction. So welcome, Joel. It's such a great, it's a, such a pleasure to be with you, to see you. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thanks, Frank. Always How are you? How are things? Here, right? How are things? Doing really good and enjoying living in California. You know, it must have been, it, it must be amazing because I know when you set out to write and do the things that you've done, you don't, you don't have any idea of what kind of impact that's going to have. And to see the millions of people, truly millions that have been affected by the work you've done must be so gratifying uh, on, on your personal journey. Thanks for that, Frank. Yeah, well, you're right. It was a, a lot of um, ex a lot of hours and hours and hours and hours of work. But you're right. I never thought I'd reach so many people and have so many opportunities to affect so many lives. So it's been yeah. incredibly gratifying. It's amazing. You know, you know, the National Health Association, for many of our viewers may not know that at one point it was the American Natural Hygiene Society. And and in many ways, their their you know, their philosophy and work, which was really all about health by healthful living and understanding the impact of, uh, you know, the biological requirements of life and health and activity and whole food, plant nutrition and so on. Are, are in many ways even the forerunner to a lot of what we now call lifestyle medicine. So, it, you know, people don't know that this yeah. is a tremendous foundation. And in your personal journey, and I'd like to get into it just a little bit, I know your father was a very much an ardent supporter of one of the founding fathers of the hygiene movement, Dr. Herbert Shelton. So you were exposed to this kind of hygienic mentality and philosophy from your childhood. So yes, how, my how, how, how did that exposure... Um, motivate your desire to move into the kind of health care that you did and even going into medical school? And how did it inform some of what you eventually wind up doing in your own life? It's been the primary factor that made me decide to go to medical school. In other words, I was a competitive figure skater. And you may know I was second in the United States in pair skating with my sister and third in the world at one point. But um, I had a major injury. I couldn't walk for over a year. That ended kind of like, um, you know, derailed my Olympic 1976 Olympic opportunity. Um, but so th at that point, I went into my family's shoe business. But I knew after a while, I realized it wasn't really what I was passionate about. What I was most passionate about was um, the, the fact that nutrition was so powerful to be able to affect people's lifestyle. And I decided to go to medical school. Um, when I was in my late 20s, already with the specific intent to be a physician specializing in nutrition. But I didn't, I hadn't, what derailed me or what, what, um, why I didn't go to medical school when I was younger also was I didn't take the pre-med courses when I was going to college and in my ice skating career as a competitive figure skater, I didn't take any pre-medical requirements. I didn't have sciences, the math, the biology, the physics, the biochemistry. I had nothing. I was economics and business at that point. So I had to go back to the, so when I decided at the age of like 26, 27, that, you know, being in my family shoe business wasn't for me. And I have more um, personal satisfaction and passion about a career in nutrition. I had to go back to Columbia and take the postgraduate pre-med program and, uh, and do my whole postgraduate, my undergraduate requirements for medical school, then take the EBCAT, then go to medical school at the age of 29. 
Yeah, Joel, I mean, your motivation was, of course, this tremendous interest in nutrition. And you've just said that. But, you know, medical schools are woefully inadequate in how they educate that component of lifestyle. So was that a problem for you when you entered the medical system or were you just happy to now learn about the body and really get involved with really understanding as much of that as possible? And then with the idea that you would then bring this nutritional component into your own private work and practice. Um, yes, both those things are true. What you just said, Frank, in other words, I learned a lot in medical school that tremendously supported the tenets of natural hygiene and what I thought, you know, what I thought was true. The first week in medical school, they taught us that all drugs are toxic and they work by interfering or blocking natural body actions. And they also discussed, and we read in the pathology books, the healing power of the body and the healing power of the inflammatory response. If I can quote Robbins and Cochran, the textbook that medical students all read, major text, it says, the inflammatory response is closely intertwined with the process of repair and serves to destroy, wall off, dilute, or otherwise remove the injurious agent and sets into motion a series of events that attempts to heal and reconstitute damaged tissue. So I'm just giving a quote from a medical textbook. So a lot of the basic biology, pathology, and physiology that we learn in medical school supports what I wanted to do with my career. And one of the weaknesses of the alternative medicine community, the lifestyle medicine community, and conventional doctors is they don't have this foundation to understand that sometimes with healing, you have to have that inflammation has positive effects on the body and the symptoms of disease can be moving the body in the right direction to enable us to afford people a recovery. Like with an asthmatic, for example, I may have to wean them off their beta agonists and even increase the steroids temporarily to keep them in control and then slowly cut down their steroids because the beta agonists, even though they relieve symptoms quickly, they put more inflammatory substances in the lung. They don't see, people don't see that the, the asthma attack itself has right directed functions to remove toxic waste from the body. And that even though it could cause death and it can cause breathing to stop, the cells don't know that. The cells are just kind of trying to get inflammation generated to get rid of waste. So we gradually reduce the steroids as we then improve great nutrition. And as we get to the point where symptoms start to develop and we're low enough on the steroids with good nutrition, then we could maybe institute a, a fast or something. But in other, in other, case, in other words, um, we have more in our toolbox whether it's suppression of headaches or whether it's um, other symptoms, restless leg syndrome or other, other types of problems people have, spasm, you know, um, cramps, whatever it is, um, digestive diarrhea. In other words, most physicians don't have the, the enough understanding of the um, healing power of the body and how kind of symptoms can be utilized to aid us in the healing process and not just try to suppress symptoms at all costs. Well, that was the, that's the philosophical disconnect, because as you well know, aside from, let's say, life-saving surgical procedures or remarkable yeoman efforts in emergency care, much of medicine is disease care management. It's not about actual providing health care. So you already have that, that underlying philosophy to realize that it's not about suppressing symptoms or holding hands or giving medication that tries to suppress something and manage an, an ongoing process, you have a sense, and this is important, that we now know that many of these problems, uh, whether it's you know high blood pressure or, or, or diabetes or heart disease, are not only preventable, but they're absolutely reversible. So for many physicians, they don't have that mentality. The idea is that once you have these problems, you'll never recover. So let me just manage this problem rather doing something that may in fact get at the cause of this problem and actually reverse it. So it's- And the remarkable. medications, of course, make things worse because obviously the drugs, let's just say for migraines, Escit, Wygain, Vanquish, Excedrin, Furanol, Furacid, whose active ingredients are barbiturates, narcotics, and caffeine, set people up for chronic headaches the rest of their life because you're doing something to suppress the detox process instead of, so we have so many, as you know, hundreds, maybe a thousand people who've got rid of chronic migraines and people recover from autoimmune diseases. It's the same thing. It's that's right. They, they were talking about. Um, there's a lack in understanding how the body works, and some, and also that affects food addiction and people's ability to to follow a diet because they they think that fatigue 
they eat for, for, to release, to keep their energy up. And they don't realize that fatigue is a detox process from their lack of nutrients in their diet and from their, and the excessive amounts of advanced glycation end products and reactive oxygen species. When they don't eat a meal, and they go into the phase of digestion where they're not where they're not eating because eating is suppressing detox. Right. When you're, you're in, in the catabolic phase of the metabolic cycle, the digestive cycle, when you're not when when you're not digesting anymore, is when the body has enhanced detoxification from the liver, and so that when people um, finish digesting the meal and no more calories are coming in and detoxification is enhanced and they feel so shaky and weak and fatigued. They got to eat more to keep their energy up. And they think that fatigue is, they think fatigue is hunger and headaches and cramping is hunger. So they, so they really are food addicts and they, there's no understanding and there's no understanding of how of this term, you know, toxic hunger, there's no understanding of understanding how the body works that really impedes both the conventional, the alternative, the obesity society, all communities don't recognize this. And I've, as you know, written and published a lot of studies and, and about this such, such a large amount. And it's not still generally even entered into the medical textbooks. They still describe hunger as something that's a detox from a bad diet, as opposed to um, sensing the sensations of re real hunger, which are a different sensation that a person is able to get when they get back to good health again. Yeah, we'll come back to that because, uh, you know, sometimes that's one of the real benefits of even something like a process of fasting where you can encounter that real sense of hunger again and not equate fatigue with hunger, which is done, as you mentioned, so, right. you know, so universally in our population, for sure. And Frank, just to make it clear, I do not recommend fasting for people with food addiction and obesity. No, I, and I agree. I'm going to come back to a fasting discussion with you in a little we'll bit. Do it, we'll do it once the people, you know, I can talk about that a little more, but it's just my years of experience and so much that show that these people who are obsessed about food, they slow the metabolic rate down excessively, but they also, it, it, in too many cases, it fuels their obsession with, with food again and gets them into a vicious sex, sex cycle of yo-yoing. They don't learn the, the techniques and the you know, the long-term skills they need to develop to stay on a diet long-term when they have this. Well, let's go, let's go there right now because you've had experience mm -hmm. supervising many fasts. You've eaten, written a, a major book about it. Right. Um, and you don't really do that now. You're not involved in the supervision of fasting as much now, I understand. Is that true? Uh, yes and no. Okay. I mean, you know, because yeah, I... I want to be, be accurate when I ask you the next set of questions because I want to ask you where do you see fasting fitting in, I in, use your, fasting mind, in your mindset now? Right. I might use fasting judiciously to aid people with certain as a part of my therapeutic protocol for various diseases, but it's not generally utilized for a person who's, you know, 50 to 100 pounds overweight or significantly overweight, who's an overeating food addict who has trouble losing weight and has trouble staying on a diet, um, fasting and even even, um, you know, even intermittent fasting where people do days of 500 to 600 calories eating. I don't even want to do that either. I want people to learn how to repeat and find what works for them, get into the program, learn the recipes and the meals and structure the diet the proper way, have repetition of this program, which is going to afford them the ability to lose two or three pounds a week, that they're going to be between usually 1,100 and 1,400 calories a day, eating super healthy foods that fill them up and give them sufficient satisfaction. And then they can stay with this long term because they may have to, it may take them six months to a year to lose all their excess weight. And we want consistency and repetition and day in and day out because that's and then and the abstinence from your addictive exposure to your love affair with your addictive substances. And I'm just saying that that appears to have the most highest probability of people having long term results with less recidivism. When I the fast, the more you fast people that are overweight and still have a lot of food addictive tendencies, it leads to a higher, uh, in my experience, a higher probability of them going back to overeating or going off the diet and, and gaining weight back after the fast and then right. back to start square one again. You know? How do you feel about the approach of looking at intermittent fasting where it's not so much a pattern of calorie restriction, but it is more a time restricted pattern of eating? Do you see any benefit for people doing these 14, 10 and 16, 8 cycles of getting all their calories, but within a, a certain window of time? That kind of kind of respects the light dark cycle, so to speak, which is that's a correct. circadian rhythm. What do you feel about that? Yes, that's what we do, and that's what we advocate. So that we do that particularly because um, detoxification and healing and the anti-aging phenomenons occur most effectively when you're sleeping at night, and they occur more effectively if you're not digesting food as you're sleeping, if your body is in the detox mode when you're sleeping. 
So you don't, so we're trying to have people eat a light enough dinner and an early enough dinner. So there are hours, they're going without food for enough hours before they go to bed. So they're not going to sleep with food in their stomach. So even if you go to, even if you stop eating five hours before bedtime, if you stuff yourself with enough food, you could still be digesting. You have to eat, you have to not eat till you're full and you have to have a, so we're recommending that, yes, that um, we, we, and we, when we want people to do time restricted eating, we generally don't want them to skip breakfast and start eating lunch at 12 or one o'clock and then eat late into the night because they're still going to sleep on a full stomach. Right. We want to intermittent fast. So the episode when they're not eating is before bedtime. So they go to sleep on an empty stomach. I try, I'm trying to do that. And sometimes I undershoot my caloric needs for the day where I feel like I'm hungry when I'm going to bed at night. But I say to myself, well, that's good. I, 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 the fact that I'm hungry means I didn't overeat today. I can have a little water and go to bed. I don't know, you know, um, but I, and when people will say, oh, I'm on this great diet, I'm never hungry. And I'm just thinking to myself, well, if you're never hungry, you're chronically overeating. You know, because you gotta, if you're never hungry, it means you're always putting in more food than you really need it all the time. You gotta have some hunger episodically to document the fact that you're not putting in too many calories. You know? right. I'm here with Dr. Joel Furman. We're gonna take a, a short break to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. And now to put a smile on the sponsors of the National Health Association, you're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is $35 per year for those living within the U.S. and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices, loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the 2023 NHA Conference set for June 23 to the 25th, 2023, in Cleveland, Ohio, which will be the NHA 75th Annual NHA Conference. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. I'm here with Dr. Joel Furman. Um, you know, it's interesting when you have systems like hygiene and you have these, uh, these systems that have these all embracing philosophies. And, and this happens with many people with their agendas for diets and programs. They, they seem to have this idea that this a, a one thing fits all approach. And so they get very adamant about these philosophical approaches and lose sight of the fact that many times you have to deal with people where, where they are and with the shortcomings they have and the past histories that they have. And so, you know, I know that this is something that you have actually spoken about because you can't just adhere to an ideal philosophy every minute because it may not be in the best interest of the person you may be counseling with. So let's talk about that just a little bit. How do you modify, you know, the, the ideal philosophy of what we know is best in the best interest in the long run, whole plant foods, you know, certain amounts of activity, sleep, rest, all of those kinds of pieces. How does that factor into how you evaluate the people that you work with and how do you transcend just getting locked in to just a philosophical approach where people can become almost like zealots, which is something that we saw very common in the hygiene movement for many, many years. People didn't care about, you know, where it was. It had to be applied a certain way. So how do you approach that? I've seen many people personally damaged from um, the tenets of the American Natural Hygiene Society as advocated by Herbert Shelton and their strict in a religious like fervor where they've damaged themselves and caused because of what because sticking to the program, even though they're doing badly like that. And being a phys being a medical doctor, I've had the unique experience of a lot of elderly um, vegans and a lot of elderly hygienists who develop problems come to me looking for answers. For example, a woman flew in from Sweden 
who was a, a, a you know a natural hygiene advocate, and she had heart advanced heart disease and peripheral vascular disease on a natural hygiene diet. And when I evaluated her, I found her homocysteine to be like you know almost a hundred, and her B12 she was so severely deficient in B12 that when I told her she's going to need to take B12 immediately because she's severely deficient, she refused. She said, Dr. Shelton doesn't recommend supplements. Says you can get enough from, so she refused. Another person that was a raw foodist who was a actual hygienist um, came to me with an ammonia, um, and he was avoiding taking antibiotics. At the time he got to me, um, he was so sick that he needed intravenous antibiotics to possibly save him. So I sent him right over to the emergency room for IV antibiotics, and he died in the emergency room for a non-treated pneumonia. For that he refused antibiotics. Um, you know, we have a whole, I can keep going more and more stories, but, um, but yes, um, and, the, and the, one of the largest factors in my um, exposure to people on vegan diets has been people who develop neurologic deficiencies in later life due to severe DH, um, omega-3 index deficiencies or DHA and EPA deficiencies, predominantly DHA deficiencies, with a lot of um, plant advocates developing dementia or Parkinson's. Um, and when you do the omega-3 index, some of these people's levels were incredibly low, almost non-existent, in spite of a healthy diet. And the vegetarian, the vegan community is such a is so philosophically bent on on like seeing it in a religious manner that they'll say something like, "Oh, that person's a junk food vegan," or they're just eating or doing that, or they're just eating, you know. And I'm saying, no, these people were healthy people on natural hygiene type diets, eating a well, a excellent diet, and develop very severe deficiencies. Which increases your, which reduces the brain's ability to to um to deal with toxins and your exposure to the toxic um, chemicals that can cause Parkinson's that are are exacerbated with omega three deficiencies. And now we have so many studies showing that that could be the Achilles heel, especially for some people who have very low levels of the of a vegan diet. Um, but there's a lot of other things that people are individual differences that we have to make modifications. And not everybody, um, you know, we have to evaluate. Um, and do what's best for the individual person. Not every child thrives or not every elderly person can thrive on a strictly vegan diet. Sometimes we have to evaluate that and make adjustments to make sure the first thing we do is make sure they're thriving and not just follow some philosophically in a rigid fashion, even if a person is not doing well. We've got to evaluate what's the cause of them not doing well and see if we can supply them with what they need to make sure they're okay. Well, so one, the of those, patients, one, you know, the yeah, patients, one of those... The outcome for the person becomes critically, becomes most important. Of course, that's the goal, the, the welfare of that person, yeah. for, sure. Yes, for sure. Well, one of the issues that you brought up uh, in, in your own writing and, and, and things that I've read about in interviews that you've done is that because there have been studies, evidence-based, to show the prevention and reversal of heart disease with low-fat, whole-food, plant-exclusive diets, one of the things that happened from that was the vilification of fat from whole food sources like nuts, seeds, avocados, things of that nature. And um, it, it almost reminds me of this idea where people for the longest time made no segregation between things like refined carbohydrates and baked goods and processed foods compared to the carbohydrates and whole plants and fruits. So right. it, it, there, there's no discrimination has been made sometimes between these you know, fractured fats that are found in these processed foods and animal foods compared to plant-based foods. And so I think some of that neurological issues you talk about can relate to that vilification of fat and the avoidance of nuts, seeds, avocados. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Because I think that's a very important point for people to hear. Two things. Number one, not only does the overwhelming amount of evidence, um, to, you know, in a, in a very, in a way with tremendous corroboration between major studies show that excluding all fat of the diet with the avoidance of nuts and seeds increases the risk of irregular heartbeat, lowers the seizures threshold, and also increases the risk of sudden cardiac death and increases heart attack risk. So the diets, that became, those diets that became more popular by studying a small group of people doing well, didn't even follow them to their death. We have much more, we have much larger studies with, with hundreds of thousands of people and many different studies that, sh that show that those are not, that's not the best way to reverse heart disease. In my career, as you know, as a board certified family physician, seeing thousands, 10,000s of people, and, you know, and maybe I'm not publishing and didn't have all the ability at that time or didn't have the, 
you know, when I'm busy seeing patients all day long, I was not putting out research like some of, like some of those doctors we're talking about did. But I assure, assure you that I've seen many thousands more people with heart disease who reversed it successfully than these doctors did when they have 50 to 60 people or 20 to 30 people in their studies. I've literally treated hundreds of thousands of people with, and reversed their heart, their heart disease, Use, utilizing nuts and seeds in the diet. However, I don't want to give the impression that because most Americans are getting their fat from oils and animal fats, and we're saying we should be getting our fats from whole plant foods, which have a completely different biological effect now. They absorb more slowly. They're professionally burnt for energy. There's all bunch of reasons why. They suck at the, the sterols suck out L, oxidized LDLs of the gut. There's just a hundred reasons why they work differently. However, they still do not fix the omega-3 deficiency problem. And that's not why people develop omega-3 deficiencies. You can't um, flaxseed and walnut your way into a, into a good enough omega-3 index in most cases. In some people can. There are some people genetically who have excellent omega-3 index in spite of the fact that because their diet is really good and they've cut out all the extra omega-6 fats and half their nut and seed intake comes from the high omega-3 nuts and seeds like flax seeds and walnuts and the other half could be the more the high omega-6 nuts like pistachios and other nuts and pecans. But, and some of those can achieve an adequate omega-3 index, but most people cannot, even with dietary manipulations and gymnastics, they cannot get their omega-3 elevated because the conversion enzymes are, genetic, are so genetically determined and they would require some degree of supplementation to make sure that omega-3 index is adequate. And you don't fill, use some philosophy to justify. So many people say, oh, well, you don't have proof that being low in a strict vegan is going to be as bad as being low if you're an animal product. People have all these rationalizations, um, which is literally gambling with people's brains, their lives, and coming up with theories why they think they don't have to worry about it. And I think those theories are dangerous for people because I've seen it. I've seen it. Ha I'm just happened too many times. Well, one of the arguments that's come up with that, and we'll address that here because I think it's a good discussion, is that when you look at the pathway from alpha linolenic acid in the omega-3 family to the output of DHA in that linear pathway, because it is a linear pathway, if you are supplement, if you do have the enzymes that could make the transformation from EPA to DHA, if you provide exogenous DHA in large amounts, it still is not addressing the EPA component of that because it doesn't go backwards. It's only a linear pathway. So when you think about that supplementation profile, are you trying to provide an EPA DHA ratio that will solve that? Or are you looking at people that have a, a, the genetic enzyme deficiency to convert EPA to DHA and that gives you justification for providing a DHA supplementation? No, what, is no, feel, what is your feeling about those feedbacks and that linear pathway, I guess, is what I'm asking you. I don't think it's a relevant point, really, because there's no supplements that just give you DHA. All the supplements that are available on the market give you both DA, EPA and DHA. And as I wrote in my book, The End of Heart Disease, it's also documented that even though deficiencies or insufficiencies could be um, harmful and more harmful, the more deficient it gets, excess can also be harmful. Right. And so... So just because there might be problems with taking too much EPA or DHA or too much DHA doesn't then make it logical that you shouldn't take any to get an, And that's with a lot oh, of I understand supplements. that. I get that. You know, so, the, so it, too much fish oil could have um, anti-inflammatory effects that could thin the blood and have weakened immune function. And then when I show, I'm also showing even atrial fibrillation it can be linked to both omega-3 deficiency or excess. We want to be in the sweet spot in the center and not have too deficient or have too much. It's the same thing true with vitamin D. Just because something's good doesn't mean you take too much of it. And just because too much of it can be harmful doesn't mean it's okay to be deficient. You know, no. so it's like same thing with zinc. You know, people just don't, some, some people can utilize, you can, if, if, they, if a person has an inherent bias, um, they can utilize any kind of data to make it look like they have some data to support them by showing an excessive amount could be bad when nobody's advocating an excessive amount. You know what I mean? When we go back to that fat question, I want to just ask you a question. So do you, do you feel that a person from those whole food sources, because we know bottled oils and so on is not what we want. Do you feel that in that range of taking about 15% of your energy calories for the day from fat is adequate? Or do you think more is necessary than 10 to 15% of total energy needs? I definitely think 10% is going to lead is more increased risk of heart disease, irregular heartbeat, and neurological deficit. I think the, these low-fat diets advocated by some leaders in the plant-based community 
they don't really have the patient experience. Almost all these people who are advocating these people, these nutritional gurus that are so famous are just researchers. They just, you know, and they don't really have a, a broad patient experience. Um, and I think that they're, that, you know, and then I'm dealing with most of these people who don't, don't do well. And they, they really can't even go to those people to see them as a problem, as a, with medical conditions that we're seeing. So in any case, yes, I've seen, um, so I think 10% of calories from fat gets too many people into trouble. And, and 15, fact, 15 works? Yes, 15 to 25 is more reasonable, you know. Yeah. And, but, and I don't think a person has to worry about whether they're 15 to 25 or 15 to 30, if as long as they're not in a favorable weight. Because calories do, ma- do count. You know, I always say half of what we eat feeds our needs and the other half feeds the needs of our doctors. Because the average American is consuming like 3,600 3, calories a day. When even in rural China, the average caloric consumption is around 1,600 a day. So it's not people thinking, oh, how could I say half of what we eat? But it's amazing how many calories people are putting down. That they, and that just, um, so calories, when you're eating such excessive amount of calories, do matter. And, we, we, and what makes eating this healthy way of eating that we, we eat, that I call a nutritarian diet, um, so effective is it makes you satisfied with the right amount of calories. So you can eat instinctually. When your diet is deficient in nutrients and your body is now full of metabolic wastes and, and external exogenous toxins as well, well, then- let's go there. Let, that, let's go there because there's a part of that that I want to discuss with you. I know that. And I feel the same way. Words, the phrases like plant-based were never good enough for me because, yeah. and, and things, the nebulousness of things like vegan and plant-based, because there's so many things that could come under that umbrella that are refined and processed and debilitating and devastating. Or imbalanced so that, and all these crazy yes, so that, le- that led you to coin the phrase nutritarian and to create kind of a system that's centered around what I gather are four basic principles. And I want to just mention those, and then I'd love for you to explain them a little bit to the audience so they get a bigger vision of the program you're talking about. So I know the first principle with nutritarian is foods that have the greatest nutrient density. And these are whole plant foods that have the greatest nutrient density. But then they also, you have to also deal with what you call nutritional adequacy, a hormone stability, and then exposure to toxic elements. So I know that that encompasses kind yeah. of more of that whole nutritarian system. So can, for our viewers, can you spend a little time explaining that the, the dynamic of that, that whole gestalt, if you will. Right. I'd like people to memorize a few words here. The five words are that form one of the basic principles are the factors that have the most scientific support to slow aging, which is moderate caloric restriction, not, you know, maximum caloric restriction or advanced, just moderate caloric restriction, just undershooting your calories by a little bit in the context of micronutrient excellence. So those are the five words, moderate caloric restriction with micronutrient excellence. And I'm saying is when you achieve micronutrient excellence, you're you're satisfied with the right amount of calories. And that's why we're we're trying to look at the micronutrient density of a diet. And the second thing I want people to write down and memorize is this, this statement. I'll read the whole statement. I'll tell them the part I want to memorize. The whole statement is more than 200 studies corroborate each other, showing that raw vegetables have the most consistent and powerful association with the reduction of cancers of all types. So here's what a part I want to memorize. Here's the part. Raw vegetables have the most consistent and powerful association with the reduction of cancers of all types. So yes, we're encouraging people to eat a, to eat a vegetable-based diet, not a grain-based diet, not a fruit-based diet, and not a, and not a meat-based diet, and not a processed food-based diet. But in any case, and we want nutritional variety. And just like eight, you know, the N over C, H equals N over C, your healthy life ex- expectancy is proportional to the nutrient per calorie, the nutritional bang per caloric buck. It's also the case that the formula is there to show that when you live on foods that are high in calories with an insignificant nutrient load, like processed foods and animal products and processed foods are both very low in micronutrients and, and absent in phytochemicals and antioxidants. In other words, their micronutrient load compared to their caloric load is imbalanced. So when you, as you eat more of your diet from high calorie, low nutrient food, you age yourself, you, can, you set the groundwork for disease. So it's not just eating foods that are richest in nutrients, it's avoiding foods that give you calories with no significant nutrient load. That's the major factor there. 
you want the biggest bang for your buck, obviously, when you're eating, and that bang for your buck is the nutrient density. Uh, what about the uh, the exaggeration of the you, know, the you know hormone stability, which is part of your program? This is a very important piece because the changes in how these fractured and fragmented diets cause such, if you will, dysfunction and imbalance in some of the more important hormones that can also be growth factors and cancer promoters. Uh, talk a little bit about that, if you can. Right. Because we know that um, there, if you would have asked me, what's the most like striking scientific findings from the last five years in the field of nutritional science, I'd have to say it's about protein. It's about showing that as animal protein is dialed up in the diet, we get more premature deaths and how animal protein can modulate the aging process where more animal protein makes for more rapid aging and less means for slower aging, while at the same time the studies show more plant protein makes for slower aging and affords people the opportunity to have a longer lifespan. So what these studies have shown is that we should be generally taking eating more plant protein and not more animal protein, but plant protein adequacy still plays a role here. And that means eating green vegetables, beans, and nuts and seeds, and not living on just a fruitarian diet, because the fruit is the only food that's low in protein in, in, the, plant, in, the, in the natural plants. So we're saying here that it is important to eat vegetables, and most people should be eating beans or soybeans and other beans, and... Um, and, and a variety of vegetables and, um, and green vegetables, which are very high in, are the richest source of, phyto, of anti-cancer phytonutrients. And I have this acronym, which you know, GBOMS, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, just to document six foods that have so much scientific support to retard and prevent cancer. And so we're just keeping aware of these foods with a lot of scientific evidence to show the anti-cancer power of those foods. And when you put these foods synergistically together in a diet, then we have the most ability to prevent cancer, not just prevent heart disease. And, and of course, we're saying here that I mentioned animal protein when you asked me about hormones, because one of the reasons animal protein accelerates aging is by raising IGF-1 too high, which can accelerate. Um, but of course, just eating more calories too many calories can obviously raise your, meta, um, raise your metabolic rate to age yourself faster too. A and that um, if our diet is too deficient in protein, another vegan and plant-based advocates say protein doesn't matter and that it's just been over-exaggerated. But I'm saying no, that we want the protein to the diet, even though lowering animal protein is beneficial, if the diet is too low in plant protein or is still too low in protein, IGF-1 in the elderly can drop too low and that can still weaken immunity. So if the IG of one drops, so you can be on a vegan diet that's too low in protein, but people say, no, you can't, but you can. You can be eating, as you know, you could be eating too much white bread or too much fruit or too much, not having the, um, a well-designed diet with enough nutritional variety, with enough protein adequacy and protein and complementary amino acids do have value. And that's what, so the studies are kind of reinforcing um, what we've been teaching people over the last 20, 30 years. Well, what I like about what I like about one of the models and things that you've spoken about is that, you know, the evidence base that has accrued over the years has vindicated the original, you know, directives of of hygiene about whole plant foods. That's one of the things that has only gotten stronger with the evidence base, while yeah. certain things like food combining and things like that from the past, of course, have been shown to not have the validity that you know, the founding fathers once did. I mean, they did the best that they could with the information at hand. But what I liked about some of what you wrote is this idea of synergy, the idea that you kind of refashion food combining in the following way, that when you eat certain cooked things together, you are actually availing yourself of even greater nutrient availability because of those combinations. For example, beans and tomatoes and onions and, and mushrooms and things like that, when combined together, provide those, those powerful antioxidants and anti-cancer nutrients even to a greater extent by that synergy of taking them in together. So it's kind of a, a new model of food combining in a way that highlights the micronutrient availability. And I like that picture of that. Yes, you, still, you stand strongly behind that, right? That idea of that kind of combination synergizing the availability of micronutrients also. Absolutely. And there's a synergy. And it also affects the microbiome, as you know, in the biofilm, which then keeps your, your back to hormones again. 
which how it keeps your insulin and glucose absorption, the rate of glucose absorption through the gut wall favorable because you're a regular consumer of mushrooms and onions and beans and greens. So we're talking about raw greens and raw onions, raw having the best effect on then cooked beans and cooked mushrooms. And when you have those two cooked foods and the two, cooked, two raw foods in your diet combined, you have the most favorable type of bacteria of gram positives that, are, that adhere and stick to the villi to create a biofilm that now slows the absorption. When you had your mango in the morning, you, how do you make a moderately glycemic food like a mango be low glycemic? Because you ate your beans and your onions and your mushrooms, which can made the glycemic load of the mango lower. And scientists call that the second meal effect. So mm -hmm. yes, there's synergy with your, in, in the whole diet. This is why the keto people can't figure out with their continuous glucose monitoring, why they say, oh, I gotta eat tuna fish and steak and cheese because if I eat fruit like an oatmeal and mango, my sugars go through the roof. Well, your sugars go through the roof because your microbiome is bad and because you've distorted, the, the, you've distorted the shape of your insulin receptors from so much saturated fat in your diet. So there's, all, so there's a whole bunch of damage that occurs that makes them now react unfavorable to a normal glycemic food. They can't eat a tropical fruit or a piece of or a bowl of oatmeal, you know, and you know. Yeah, I want to move. I want to shift gears a little bit. Before I do, though, I just want to let people know where where's the best place to find you online, Joe. What's what, what's the place you want them to go to to find more about you and your information? Well, obviously, drfurman.com, you know, D-R-F-U-H-R-M-A-N.com. And my most recent book with the most updated references is Eat for Life. So that's the most, you know, it's always get better to get the one with the more newer references as opposed to, and more references, because as you just said a few minutes ago, more evidence has corroborated these theories that we've developed over the years. And there's so much evidence, it makes it undeniable. If you really read it with all the evidence available, it make, makes it, you know, undeniable and really hard to. to so I want to shift, I want to shift gears just a little bit, because, you know, we've come through a time where there was this kind of crazy pandemic that really altered the lives of so many people and affected so many people. And during that time, what was portrayed was that a sense of hopelessness, the idea that, you know, we cannot adjust and deal with these kinds of, you know, changes in organisms in the environment. It took away people's uh, real, took, it, it kind of countered the wisdom that we know that we have this tremendous internal surveillance and protective system that we call the immune system. And I want you, if you can, I know you wrote your book, Super Immunity, I want you to address the power of nutrition and lifestyle choice as a tool that people have to really enhance this incredible wisdom and ability of their immune system to respond. Can you do that, please? Absolutely. We should go on. We keep asking me things that we should go on for hours. It's I know, I know. I just, but I want to touch on so many things I want to just at least touch on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Okay. The, um, yes, because it's, it's, and it's so fascinating to me. I'll tell you the most fascinating part is that in spite of the fact that all the studies show that the most overweight people have the most highest risk of death and people with comorbidities like diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease and people who ate poorly and ate fast foods had higher rates of COVID death. In spite of all of that, no, popu no population group in no area of the, of the world lost weight, turned to a healthy diet and tried to get to increase the risk of death and to lower the risk of death from COVID. In spite of all this evidence going all over the media and all these people you know, talking about how overweight people are dying more, um, nobody's saying, well, maybe I should start eating healthier and drop some extra body fat. Body fat is pro-inflammatory tissue that releases cytokines and lipokines that make for a cytokine storm and, and throw out in their oxygenated, poorly oxygenated tissues and it, it, it impair, um, impairs immunity and increases risk of pneumonia and COVID. And, and you'd think, well, people were losing weight. No, they even gained weight through COVID. They even ate more unhealthy through COVID. It shows how you know food addiction is so infiltrated society. But absolutely, your answer to your question is that our, our, our immune system, the defenders at the gates of the castle in the intraepithelial lymphocytes that surround the villi of the digestive tract are the first line of defense. And those lymphocytes atrophy and lose their function when you don't eat sufficient green vegetables. They're green vegetable dependent lymphatic system. And so, and which are fueled by the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which utilizes the ITCs, the isothiocyanides in green cruciferous vegetables to be fully activated. So yes, when you eat, these people have no immune, almost no immune function because they don't eat, they're not eating sufficient vegetables and eating no raw food, no greens and salads every day. I always say, if you don't like green vegetables, you better live close to a hospital because you're going to probably need one pretty soon. But of course, that's a stupid joke because the hospital's not going to give you good health anyway. 
You know, but, but this, the whole joke doesn't make sense. But it reminds me of I like to go skiing and see these expensive homes where on the side of the slope so people can get right on the slope. But I, people should buy these expensive condos right near the hospitals so they can go right back and forth on like trams to the hospitals and see their doctors all the time because they become medically dependent from their diet and their life becomes one giant tragedy with everybody, you know, with the ma these weapons of mass destruction on every street corner and people, you know, eating themselves to death. And, and, and to speak to that, there are huge international studies indicating people that were on whole plant diets were in the lowest risk of severity of this infection. And the fact that this kind of information was not really, you know, provided to the population is really criminal in its own way, too. It's just remarkably debilitating and devastating in its own way. Um, let's go to something else, because I, I, I just want to I'll wrap up with a couple of these ideas in terms of you know, aging and weight loss, it's kind of intriguing. We're always looking for magic bullets. As a physician, and I want to bring this up, how do you feel about people utilizing, you know, these various now pharmaceuticals to kind of approach these problems like Ozempic drugs, like anti-diabetic drugs to provide these rapid weight loss programs or uh, pre-diabetic or anti-diabetic drugs like metformin? which we know can, check, can, can interfere with the aging pathways in cells, but at the same time, you're dealing with pharmaceutical interventions and people are losing sight of the fact that these profound, simple approaches with the nutrition you're talking about and physical activity and other lifestyle factors will get that job done without these ancillary risks. As a physician, it must disturb you to see these pharmaceutical approaches getting their hey, another heyday of popularity. How do you feel about that? Yeah, you know, to some degree, as you know, I'm left alone in the wilderness here as the only physician that objects to these things, probably. Because people aren't given informed consent. You want to, you know, they're not told the, and whether it's diabetic medications and telling them they're never going to be on these drugs the rest of life, whether it's high blood pressure drugs, whether it's weight loss drugs, and both, by the way, these people, most people who are overweight need to lose more than 20 pounds. These medications don't cause a lot of weight loss. They cause like 10 kilograms of weight loss over a year. That's 22 pounds. How's right. that going to help a person who's 75 pounds overweight? And by, and by the way, um, it's only, you know, to what I'm saying right now is the direction of the travel of the weight plays a role because when a person loses, let's say you lose 50 pounds, you gain 10 pounds back, you're worse you're higher risk of having a heart attack because you just put on 10 pounds before than if you lost, then even though you're 40 pounds less than when you started, you're just moving the direction of gaining to back, back weight. So all these people do is yo-yo their weight, push their weight down, and then their weight comes back. They bounce back with some rebound effects because the drugs don't work as much the second year. And it's not a permanent, so they're not permanent solutions. People, and it, it just reinforces it. They don't have to learn how to eat right. And it's the same thing with gastric bypass to a degree. Gastric bypass, but, but in any case, um, I'm teaching people that a nutritarian is a person who's eating a, an excellent diet who's at their ideal weight or a person who's eating an excellent diet and moving towards their ideal weight every single week. And the minute you're not losing or the minute you're gaining, then you're not on the program. Because if you're overweight and you're gaining weight, you're doing the wrong thing and your health is not going to be good. Because your health is not good when you're putting on, when you're in the process of gaining weight. And we're amazingly... While the person could be 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight, but they're still dropping weight steadily, we're keeping the inflammation down. We're keeping the um, HSCRP, the high-sensitive C-reactive protein, the myeloperoxidase, the inflammatory markers, the insulin levels are lower, the estrogen levels are lower, the angiogenesis promoters are lower. Or the, so we're seeing benefits occurring when a person is still overweight if they're steadily losing and doing it the right way. But once you start yo-yoing, once you start gaining, regaining, once you start even taking drugs, you're not going to see the benefits hormonally, anti-inflammatory, and the anti-inflammatory benefits. You just don't see the carotenoid scores go up and the nutrient, the, the levels of nutrients going up in their body and the levels of inflammation going down and the new hormones going back to normal. You're just not fixing the person. You're just giving them a crutch, another crutch, the same way medicine is practiced with everything else. Let, let's shift into one of your... Uh... One of your proud babies that are in operation now, after everything you've done and all the energy you put out, and I know how difficult it is to run retreats and centers, tell me about the Eat to Live uh, retreat and what was your motivation and your drive to put this residential center together? It was about wanting, because I, I know that a lot of, as you know, a lot of people can get benefits and do well from reading books and watching videos and studying and going to internet, you know, 
involvement and have support. But some people, I, my feeling over the years was I had people I really cared about that just weren't able to control their behavior due to food addiction and they've just, you know, and, and ruined their health, even though they knew what they should do and they couldn't do it. So I knew that, um, that going away to these health retreats for a week or two where people eat healthy, go on sprouts, lose weight, and go back and they go off their diets and go back and gain the weight back. It does them no good. But I wanted to have a place where I could make it, um, where people could be on the right program for months at a time. You know, we're talking here that I don't admit people if they come in less than 30 days, that's minimum, but I really recommend people come in three months. You know, so most of the people are here at least two or three months, actually the majority. And there I really feel good about the fact that I can get them off their medications and I can retrain their, not only their taste muscle, but also I can retrain them psychologically to see the world in a different way and to know how to deal with the, you know, the social interactions, the temptations there since their addictions and they, and get more gratitude for the, and more, feel more grateful for having learned this information and really understanding how this is the way they're gonna be most happy. When they leave, it takes time to get people turned around. And so it makes, so I really um, love the fact that I've turned around so many people and even people who were here who didn't wanna be here. Like a person who comes in because their parents forced them to be here and they weigh 350 pounds. And they're saying, there's no way they're gonna eat like this. There's no way you're gonna, by the time they're left in three months, they not only lost hundred pounds, but they, stayed eating this way when they went home for the next year and dropped another 100 pounds. And they, you know, so they, and they loved eating this way and became like, I have my helper here. And like the young person became at first state, you know, they were, you know, were forced here like a prison. And in other words, it's very rewarding. And I wanted that, uh, this different part of my life to, to not to work so hard, seeing patients all day long for hours and hours each day. But I wanted to be more with a lower number of people with a bigger connection with them. Um, which I could still get my enjoyment of helping people and doing so in a way that has profound effects on the rest of their lives. How, how, many, how much bed space do you have, Joe? How many people do you take at a time there? Um, well, not many. We're only like 15 to 20 people. Yeah, that? that's, yeah, but that's, that's very manageable, workable, and it's high quality when you do that. So mm -hmm. in that program, you have a built-in opportunity for behavioral modification, stress management, that kind of thing as part of your staff people that do that too? Yes, absolutely. And I even have... Um, you know, full-time exercise and water aerobics, but we're trying to mostly teach them uh, exercises when they would go home. And I also have here, some people come in with pain and, and you know, bad feet and bad knees. And we also have um, some electro, we have um, soft wave TRT. It's a, it's a type of electrocorporal shockwave therapy. And I, and I actually, I look at people's pronated feet and I do exercises with them in the sand and walking and strengthening their foot muscles. And we take pressure off the medial tibial condyle so they can walk more comfortably. So the time they get out of here, they can usually walk far distances and without, without pain. And I also have the extra corporal shockwave therapy. It's the type of equipment called soft wave TRT that they get a series of treatments which can take away their frozen shoulder or their, you know, their cartilage in their knee or fix their Achilles tendonitis or something like that. Um, so we have some other physical modalities that we utilize to help them be able to be, to kind of help their pain and their physical musculoskeletal system at the same time. Joe, as we wrap this up, do you have any final words, you know, words of wisdom, insight, information you'd like to share with the people watching this? Um, yes, I would just um, really am enthusiastic about all the people that are growing and spreading this good word to other people because every person becomes like a super have the superpowers to radiate out goodwill for other people. And then you can't have goodwill for other people unless you're a good role model yourself, taking good care of your own health. And then you have the greatest reward to have creative goodwill for others while you're taking care of yourself at the same time. So don't give up, strive towards getting your health in better and better condition, both physically, emotionally, and getting your weight at the exact perfect target where you're working on your musculature your, and your weight perfectly because it's a fun hobby to be gardening, growing healthy food, organic, regenerative agriculture that you do yourself to, and, and, and being physically involved with exercise and, and taking good care of your health and eating right all becomes fun and an exciting hobby that benefits you and others. Joe, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today to come on and, and share your information with everyone. And I totally encourage our viewers to uh, go online. But, uh, and uh, Joel's uh, information will be in the show notes, so you can see that too. 
follow him, uh, his books, his uh, public uh, broadcasting uh, specials, all the things that he's doing. Uh, look into his retreat for those people who need that kind of work and that long-term care. And that's a fantastic place to be in San Diego. I know it's a beautiful, beautiful location environmentally for people too. And I especially want to thank our, our uh, viewers out there because without you, we couldn't do what we do here. I couldn't do what I do. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I thank you. I'm very grateful for you to be part of this active community. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the Director of Health Education for the National Health Association. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.